Hey guys, uh, we have Gabriel Triplet. Special story, special human, special person, uh, and she is willing to share this with us. Gabrielle, say hello to everybody and uh, hello, everybody. tell us a little bit about yourself. Like, where are you now? Where do you live? I live in Sarasota, Florida. I am employed with Sale of Freedom, which is a nonprofit organization, and their mission is to end sex trafficking and bring freedom to the exploited. I am a survivor of sex trafficking, and I graduated their residential program in 2019. And I've been on staff for about a year now as their volunteer advocate. Where did you grow up? Uh, what happened to you and when it happened to you? I grew up in um, Baltimore, Maryland till about the age of 12. And then we moved to Sarasota, Florida. So before that, before turning 12, I was a very quiet child. My parents, they struggled emotionally. My, my father struggled with drugs and alcohol and he has severe schizophrenia. And my mother, just with the trauma that she experienced as a child, her and my father both, whether it was death of a parent or sexual abuse when they were small, you know, they just carried that into adulthood and it really affected them emotionally. So when they had me, they just weren't able to give me the love and support I needed. So I grew up very insecure, very quiet child. And so by the time I hit those teen years, when I was 12 or 13 and we were moving to Florida, I just felt like an alien to everybody else. Um, I felt internally like nobody really cared about me or cared of what I had to say. So I was very introverted and I was going through this like gothic phase where I would wear all black and... Your parents were sexually abused. Yes. And that led them to to have their own issues and that basically trickled on to you as a person and you're 13 years old, 12 years old, and you don't know what to do with yourself and you don't feel that you fit in here. In my teen years, you know, my mother and father split up. My mother remarried and I'm kind of just going through the motions of life. There's really no um, anyone speaking into me that was encouraging me that you can be whatever you want to be when you grow up, you know, nobody um, helping me with homework or anything like that, you know, so I started to hang out with the wrong people. Are you the only child? I have um, an older sister who didn't grow up with us and I have a couple younger siblings. We're about a year apart. So you're hanging out with the wrong people now in Florida? Yes, in Florida. So I'm starting to smoke pot, starting to drink, and I dropped out my first month of 10th grade and I started to work. And um, a couple years later, I, I got pregnant. I had a child at the age of 18. Why have a child? I have no role models around me that are um, guiding me through anything. It was kind of a free for all when I grew up and you know, nobody to talk to me about and things in life like sex, making the right choices. This is not the right choice. And just having like open communication with me. Like I, I didn't have that. So I had my first child and I'm a single mom now. I'm 18. I'm, I'm working. I'm really trying to do the best that I can with what I have. And I was introduced, again, I'm still hanging out with these wrong people. You know, they're not doing what they're supposed to. They're all dropouts. They're all partying and hanging out. And I say my daughter was about one and someone introduced me to pills, like pain pills. 
And I started to take these and think, you know, to myself, wow, you know, I have the energy to um, work, come home, kind of play with my daughter, still cook and clean. And it was like amazing. I felt amazing. I finally felt good about myself, good about what was happening. After and the pills. After these pills, yes. After oh. these pain pills. It started oh. off like hydrocodone and, you know, five, 10 milligram pain pills like that. And I was a functioning addict for maybe less than a year, I was still able to hold a job and take care of my daughter. And then I wasn't, you know, um, again, these bad people are still around me making bad choices. And it quick, I quickly went downhill. So now I'm shooting up pills. I'm using heroin. My daughter's no longer with me. She's why is that? Well, because these drugs had just consume me, I'm not able to take care of her anymore. I'm not able to take care of myself. So my daughter went to go live with her father and his parents. And at this point, your daughter is taken away from you. You are on drugs. What's going on in your mind? The drugs were just really at the forefront of my mind. They had just totally consumed me. My addiction was just taking control of my whole life, my whole being now. It hurt that I wasn't able to take care of my daughter. And I felt like a, you know, total POS. But at the same time, I still needed these drugs. I still needed to continue to use and um, just stuff those feelings. So I continued to do that for a couple years and I found myself homeless on the street, living in abandoned houses and just totally lost. What about the, the people that you hung out with? Were they supporting you? Absolutely not. When you live a lifestyle like that, it's, um, it's like every man for themselves. No, you have no friends when you are, um, on the streets or using. So you started living in abandoned houses. Yes, living in abandoned houses, or if somebody would let me crash on their couch, I've slept in the woods, I would steal things, whatever I could do to continue to numb and, you know, continue to feed this addiction, I would do. So one day, now all this is happening in Ocala, Florida. I'm walking down the street and this lady approaches me and I didn't know that prostitution was a thing. I didn't know you could sell your body and people would give you money. You know, I'm just a young, dumb, just a mess. And this woman approached me and she's like, hey, what are you doing out here? Why don't you come hang out with me and my friend? You know, we have drugs. We're going to get a hotel room, you know, and we're just going to hang out for a little bit. And I'm like, okay, drugs. That's all you needed to say. And I I'm there. So we go to this hotel room. And of course, they want me to do things with them sexually. So I do these sexual things with them. And they leave drugs, they leave money, and now I have a hotel room, and they leave. Felt at the time dirty, disgusting, but I have everything I need now. So I continued to do that. I, I would prostitute myself and um, just walking the streets. I would sell myself on Backpage. It's kind of like Craigslist. I don't think they have it anymore, but what you could do is post pictures of yourself and say, hey, um, come hang out with me, you know, and men and women would call and they would say, hey, I want to come hang out. And I'm like, okay, well, you come hang out with me for X amount of time. And um, they would come. I would do whatever they wanted and they would leave me money and they would leave. 
anyone and everyone on the internet. Yeah. Yeah. And how did you figure that out? Like, how was the second time you encountered a uh, uh, sexual transaction? The first time was this woman who picked you up on the road. Yeah. What happened on the second time? Like, you know, the bell went off in your mind that, oh, I can sell my body and it can still have the product to sell it again, so to speak. So how did you get your second one? Probably just walking down the street and hanging out and waiting for somebody to pick me up. And yeah, some something like that. It wasn't like automatic. I know how to get on back page. I don't remember how I figured out that that was a thing. Was it the drugs that makes you not remember? There was times I was using and I remember going down the street and blacking out. And I would be in the middle of traffic, trying to cross the street, running into buildings. So it was, it was not good. Like the people that you see on the street that are nodding out, that was me. Don't be, don't be sorry. My, the things that have happened in my life have brought me to this point. And I have so much health and success now, and I'm able to share my story and help other people, you know, and other women. Because the, the vulnerability for people to be trafficked, my, I was the easiest target for traffickers. I'm already selling myself. I already have this major drug addiction. Um, so don't, don't feel sorry. I can share my story and encourage people and know, you know, this, this isn't the end for you. you. There's so much more to life. You know, I was, I was in drug addiction, we'll say from the time I was 20 till 2018. So I'm, I'm about to be 35 now, if you can figure out the mental math really quick. So <laughs> How long were you doing this on your own before you found yourself in the hands of a trafficker? I was on the streets, I will say, for maybe a year or two, kind of doing it myself. And um, so my first trafficker was somebody who pretended to be interested in me. And, um, you know, he was selling drugs and telling me, you know, let me take care of you. Let me protect you. What you're doing is so dangerous. You need somebody there who's got your back. And so I'm like, okay, you know, I'm thinking this person really cares about me. Um, that's just totally not the case. You know, he's totally taking advantage of me. So now he's posting me on these sites. I don't even need to do it. He does everything. He takes me to a hotel room somewhere, you know, that I don't even really know where I am anymore. And people are just showing up to the door now. And I just do these sexual acts with them. They give me the money. And this man comes every so often. He might give me some food. He might give me some money. And sometimes he might come and be abusive to me, whether that's physically or um, emotionally yelling at me, maybe because nobody's coming now and that's my fault. Um, and he would leave me in the middle of places that I had no idea, really, really just dope sick and just reliant on him. I was able to get away from him. I think, I can't remember how, if he brought me back to like Ocala and, you know, I'm familiar with that area. Now I'm able to kind of get away and continue to sell myself. What's happening with your parents at this point and your child? Um, so my daughter is still with her father and her grandparents and my parents. Um, they kind of like washed their hands of me if that's the right statement you know like um it's easier to not think about me or you know 
if 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 I try to go home, you know, I'm on so much drugs and they're just trying to live their own life. I'm a problem. I'm a hassle. They just want me to leave. So I didn't have anybody I could be like, you know, help me or I felt like that really even cared. You know, my my last trafficker um he uh, again, he approached me as somebody who was interested in me, who wanted a relationship with me. I'm an easy target. You know, I'm already selling myself. I've already have this drug addiction. Um, and he was, everything was okay for a while. And then he started to hit me and, you know, the abuse got worse and worse. And, you know, um, I just knew like I had to get away from him. Like this was life or death. So I'm like planning my escape because anytime I would try to leave this person, he would find me, whether I was in a different hotel room or something, he would find me and he would be very physically abusive. So, I mean, the last time he had beat me, I, he beat me so bad. I defecated myself. I had big chunks of hair you know, that he had ripped out of my, my head. I mean, it was, he was very, very, very abusive. He would hold knives to my throat and just use this intimidation and scare me. Like these men didn't have to chain me to a bed. One, I'm doing it myself and they're so abusive. I'm just giving them money. Just don't hurt me. I'll do whatever you want to appease you. Just give me the drugs. Just, you know, just don't hurt me. So it's all about drugs. It's it's all about drugs. Could you talk to somebody? The only other people that were around me were on drugs too. You know, if they witnessed him hitting me or doing anything, they're not saying anything. They're just there for the drugs too. So there was nobody that I could say, help me, or that I feel like wanted to help me. You must be absolutely lonely. Did you even feel that? The drugs numb you. You don't feel much of anything when you're using, especially in the amounts that I was by this time. What were the amounts? Oh my gosh, I could use probably $200 worth of heroin a day. Yes. And if somebody else came with something and they were like, hey, come, you know, you want some of this? I would do that too. If I was sick, I would do anything you had just to not feel sick anymore. So two hundred dollars worth of heroin, and for that, how many times a day would you have to go sleep with someone? Sexual acts. It depends on who's coming and knocking on the door. Maybe this person has. $20 and I'm really sick and I need uh, money to pay for this hotel room. Not to mention there's this man now, these traffickers that also need money for their drugs, you know, cause I'm supporting their habits as well. Wow. Um, whatever, whatever they may need. Um, so it, it really just depends. Don't the motel owners know something is going on because they see so many men coming? So this hotel that um, this happened at, there was multiple drug dealers staying there. The men who owned the hotel were also purchasing sex. So it's not, they, they could care less. It's a current thing. And it's happening in America. Absolutely. You feel helpless and you you don't know who to go to. Nobody cares. I'd be walking down the street covered in bruises, busted lip. You can tell I am a mess. There's a man with me who's controlling. Like I'm running away from him at times. And nobody helped me. Nobody, nobody cared. And when you say streets means you may be at a mall or a shopping center or walking down to the gas station and people saw you busted in your face and you were bleeding and so on. And they still, nobody stopped to say to you, what happened?
can I help? There was one person who asked me, are you okay? But then he asked me for my phone number. So it's just another person who wants to take advantage of me and, and, and use me. Or were there times that you were not getting the drugs? What would happen to you if you, if you stopped cold turkey? Withdrawals are so, they're so painful. I mean, imagine vomiting and having diarrhea and feeling like your skin is crawling or your bones are about to come out of your skin and you just want to bang your head up against the wall. I mean, it is, it's brutal. It's brutal. I mean, that's why so many people stay stuck in addiction. The pain that you feel, it's like you're in the desert and you don't have any water, you don't have any food. And then something comes along and they give you a tablespoon of water. You're like satisfied this much and you still have this constant need and you're starving and then something comes along and they just give you a cracker, you know, and you're in this constant state of like, desperation and need and it's just consuming you and then sometimes you might get a glass of water and you're like oh my gosh I feel so much better I, I gotta get another glass of water and you frantically are searching for another glass of water or a cracker somewhere and it's just this this uncontrollable need is it coming to your mind that you can get up and go to the hospital what were they going to do? I had been to the hospital a couple times just in deliria of being up for multiple days at a time, thinking bugs were on my skin. They were confused. They had, they didn't know how to help me. They were like, you're, you're fine. Let me check your blood pressure. Well, you know, you're okay. And just sent me along my way. There was no help. No, let's put some, you know, pamphlets, resources in your hands for detox center. Or not, there was nothing like that. The police? Never had a run-in with the police. And if they seen me walking down the street, they never stopped me. They never asked me, what are you doing? Are you okay? You're saying that the world was judging you at this point. And that's why no one came to your rescue. Seeing me as a nuisance? You know, some, I'm an adult, I'm not a child. You know, this person can get help on their own. You know, I feel for the people that hold signs on the street, they're not out there because they want to be. They're out there because they feel like they have nowhere to turn, they have no choice. Granted, there may be some people who are using that as like a, a way to scam people, but honestly, that's so few and far between, you know? And the people that are judging and saying, why don't they just get a job? You know, I'm sure that there's things, reasons holding them back from getting a job, whether that's drugs or mental illness or whatever that may be. So people just ignore it. It's not their problem. It's not their family. So what made you want to get away from it? The last time that he beat me, I'm like, I, I, I gotta get away from him. You know, this knowing in my soul that I have to get away from this person. Um, so one morning he finds out that I'm trying to leave and he pulled out a gun and shot me in the chest. And this was at the same hotel where the owners are purchasing sex. Oh my God. He shoots me and I was so shocked and confused because the gun went off, there's sparks and smoke. And I'm like, that's so weird thinking. And then I take a deep breath and realize that he shot me. And I was able in that moment to talk him into calling 911, say somebody else ran in here and shot me, go hide the gun. He did everything I said. So when the ambulance came to get me and I'm going to the hospital, I'm just thinking in my mind, 
somebody's going to come up here now and they're going to kill me. And I'm to finish the job. He just shot me. Wow. So you're paranoid that you feel that he wanted you dead. He couldn't do it. He'll have someone else do it. Is that possibly possibly, or he might come up and do it himself. Are you not concerned about dying at this point? Yeah, like he's going to come up and, and sh shoot me again. You're hurting? What's going on? Like, where's the blood? But when I got to the emergency room, um, you know, somebody came, I'm detective to talk to me. And I'm so scared. I'm so confused. I just said the lie that I told him, the trafficker, to tell to 911. And um, I don't know at what point they arrested him. My trafficker is in prison for 25 years for what he did to me for um, human trafficking and for assault um, with a deadly weapon, I believe. You know, in, in the hospital, they're giving me the drugs I need. So I'm not going through withdrawal or anything like that. And the detective had come up there that one time and that was it. I'm listed as trauma Charlie. So when I am released from the hospital, they give me some pain pills to take with me. How long were you in the hospital? Um, I think maybe a week and a half, two weeks. They stitched you up and so on. I had laparoscopic surgery. So the gun that he had that he shot me with was something he purchased from somebody and it was meant to like scare away animals. I don't know what caliber of gun it was. It's supposed to just, um, as the guy said, like just hit them like a little BB or something like that and scare them away. So I don't, I, and I told the detectives this, this man, I don't think his t intention was to kill me in hindsight. He just wanted to, uh, you know, hurt me some more and, you know, be abusive. I'm released from the hospital. I have this prescription for pills and, you know, I'm leaving still with drugs in the forefront of my mind. You know, that's, that's the ultimate thing that I need to do is, you know, just continue to numb. Even after you were, you know, shot with a gun. The only thing that is a, a drugs just had totally consumed me. I, I'm, that was number one in my life wow. over everything else. If Satan would have came up to me and said, sell your soul, you know, I would have done it for drugs. So now you're out of your, or out of the hospital. And so you are afraid that the tracker is going to trafficker is going to come and get you, or is he already arrested? I my main concern was I needed to continue to numb. That's at the forefront. Um, he's not around me at the moment, um, so it, 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 that wasn't my concern. Um, I was out of the hospital for maybe 24 hours. And again, I'm going to walk the street. Somebody's coming to pick me up. And I mean, if so, I had a, I had a warrant for my arrest. So I had a misdemeanor for driving without a license um, and I had to do 30 days in jail. So 24 hours after, out of the hospital, I'm walking down the street, I'm standing somewhere and a police officer pulls up and asks me what I'm doing. Out of all these years of doing things like that, now somebody wants to ask what I'm doing. So I give him a fake name. I, you know, I'm trying to not get arrested. I know I have a warrant and um, they figured it out who I was. So I'm going to jail now. And 
going to jail. You know, they're booking me. And the detective came to see me. Um, not the original guy from the hospital. This is a new guy. And he's trying to talk to me. He's trying to offer me support, but I don't want it. I'm in the mindset of um, like having this street mindset. Snitches get stitches now. And, you know, I, I, I want nothing to do with you. So he left, they booked me and I went through withdrawals while I was in jail. And that probably was four or five days. And all of a sudden, this man comes to see me. Now, generally, they don't let men to see women, but they let this man come see me. And they let us sit in this little room above this, um, we call it a pod, you know, general population. There's like a quiet room where people come to bring like AA meetings from outside in church. So they let us sit up there. And this guy says, I know your mom. And I'm like, okay. She goes to church at my church and she's been saved. I'm like blown away because that's not my mom. Anyway, this guy shares Jesus with me and he shares forgiveness and I accepted Jesus into my heart and I left that conversation with that man totally changed. Instead of having drugs in the forefront of my mind, I leave and I'm like having conversations with God and I just know deep down that I and worth so much more and I need help I can do this and um so I got a hold of the detective that came to see me when I got booked into jail and I told him you know I I want help I'm ready to talk I'm ready to tell you everything that happened and um so from that point you know I was being open with the police department, Detective John Lytle, and telling him everything that I went through. And I couldn't identify as being a, um, a victim of sex trafficking. I just thought I'm a prostitute. This is, this is just, I chose all of this for myself. But they didn't view me that way. Um, so when I, I asked for help, I said, I, I need help. I want to change. He connected me with Sale of Freedom, which is where I work now. And so when I was released after 30 days, um, I chose to go into their residential program and begin taking steps towards my recovery. As a filmmaker and a photographer, my job... I want to do more, but I believe that my job is to bring awareness to this. Things that people forget, things that people just take things for granted. I mean, now I am on this subject of of human trafficking and sex trafficking. Uh, the film that I did before this was about horses, and you know, it it's got it's it, whatever needs my attention. So as as a creator of content and you know, as a creator of beautiful things, I believe it's my job to bring the things that people really need to know. It's not always beauty, you know, let's make things that are not so beautiful and bring them to the forefront and make it beautiful. So that's my thinking and speaking to him would be a honor. So tell me a little bit about, or tell me a lot about Sailor Freedom. They're a life-changing organization. They helped me be who I am today. Um, they have five different areas of their organization. So it's a multi-prong approach. They have their residential program, which is one I went into, and it's essentially safe house. You know, you go, Sela means, it's a Hebrew word that means pause, rest, and reflect. 
and survivors coming out of those trafficking situations off the streets, out of jail, out of detox, you know, they get to come into this program, get that chance to really pause, rest, and see what they want to do moving forward with their life. And whether that's with SELA or another organization, depending on how they were introduced to SELA. Um, so in the residential program, they are um, survivors going through that are working on basic life skills, how to cook, how to clean. And as time goes on, they're working on educational goals, career goals. I got my GED while I was there. Um, I have my associate's degree now, and now I'm working on obtaining my bachelor's degree. Um, so another thing that Sale of Freedom is helping with, um, when somebody's in this lifestyle, like what I had, um, you get in trouble. Charges come. I have a felony, a misdemeanor. It doesn't matter that I have all of this health and success now. I have these barriers, whether that's finding, I, I own my first home now. So the Lord is making a way for me and my family. And I'm reunified with my children and my family and things are, uh, and I have almost six years clean now. So they have a lawyer that is working with me. Um, pro bono to help get my record expunged. You know, when I got those charges, I was being trafficked. So hopefully that that will um, come through for me because yeah, it, they are barriers. Um, so some other things that Sale of Freedom does, we have our outreach program and that is an outpatient kind of services. Um, they receive the same care as the residential program, the educational career goals, trauma therapy, um, counseling. The trauma therapy is phenomenal. I went to my first session and trying to tell some of the details of what happened to me. I mean, I was just living in that moment, crying. Every muscle in my body is tense. And now I can share that story and not have those negative feelings attached. The way it happened was you met this gentleman, the detective, and the detective passed you on to Sailor Freedom. And yes. Sailor Freedom came into your life at that point and has cleaned your entire life, your lifestyle to begin with. Now, mm -hmm. do you ever think of going back to drugs? I believe that God and the Holy Spirit has totally set me free and I would never return back to that. The, the things that I experienced and went through were so traumatic. I could never see me going back and, and doing that. And, and what you learn in the rooms of recovery is, you know, one is too many and a thousand is never enough. So I would never dare take a sip of alcohol, smoke a cigarette, nothing that is going to uh, possibly throw me back, back into that lifestyle. So I'm part of the awareness team. And um, I'm their volunteer advocate. So what we do is we go out into the community and we educate people on what's happening. Like this is a reality. This is happening in our backyard. It's just, you know, and, and the, the vulnerabilities, um, who's vulnerable to this and um, helping people know what the common misconceptions are and things like that. And then how they can get involved. We do a lot of, um, fundraising. We work a lot with the media, social media, just getting that out there that this is happening. We have our prevention team. Prevention team goes into the schools to prevent this from happening in the first place. So they work really closely with the kids with age appropriate curriculum. And then they also work with the teachers and with parents, helping them like with language. How do you have a conversation with a small person without traumatizing them or, or confusing them. Um, and we have a consulting team, which is the newest arm of our organization. So Sale of Freedom has been around since 2010, I believe. So they've had time to perfect what they're doing and they've built a curriculum. So they're walking alongside other people who wanna start safe houses of their own. We have such a shortage of beds 
right now? If there are so many victims, then why don't we have enough beds? So I don't think people realize that it's a problem, you know, and we're grateful. I'm grateful for you and spreading awareness. The way my film started was I was, yes, of course, you know, you understand that there's prostitution going on and you understand that there is drug addiction going on in the world. And, you know, America is no different. But when I met with this person and she told me the hor horrific details of her life, that did something to me. It shook me. And I went back home, discussed it with my wife, that we made a film that was my first feature film. I had tried one feature film before that, which I failed tremendously. but. Uh, it was my first feature film and my, we said, if you're trying to help horses, why shouldn't we help human beings? And this just got underneath my skin. And after that, I have interviewed 82 survivors. Uh, one of the survivors, she was eight or seven when she was abused by her own father. Until the age of 11, she thought that was a normal thing that a father does. Yeah. Because she just didn't know. Right. And right. when she, at the age of 11, when she was speaking to a friend, then it blew up, you know, and everybody found out and he was arrested and whatnot. And, and I'm saying to myself, the only reason why this girl doesn't know that that's not the right thing for a father to do is because we don't even speak about it in school. Well, that's the good thing about our prevention team. They going into the schools and helping kids, um, you know, identify safe people that they can talk to. What's the difference between a secret and a surprise and just helping them understand, you know, what what's right and what isn't when it comes to physical touch and, and, you know, things like that. It was not just a hidden thing in the house. It was open with the mother as oh. well. Mm -hmm. So she was just thinking this is a normal thing to, to happen in her family. I, she, mm -hmm. was, she was a kid. She was seven years old. So, yeah. so I, I just, and I'm not pointing a finger at anybody, but I just feel that it's the society has a job as well. And the society's job is to prevent that by educating people. And that should be in schools. Schools should be speaking about sex abuse. Schools should right. be speaking about all of this, the drug abuse, the sex abuse. How many classes or how, many, um, how much information do we give our kids? I never heard my boys come back and say, hey, we have a, a sex class today. You know, I never had, uh, my boys never came back and told me that. So mm -hmm. are we teaching our kids enough? You know, to, so anyway, bottom line, the reason why I started this film is based on all this, these messages and, and the conversations that I've had with trafficked, trafficked girls. I never interviewed a, a man or a boy that was trafficked, but I'm sure they are there. Um, Absolutely. Just bring awareness to it. So I think what Sela Freedom is doing is, is absolutely amazing. You mentioned something to me about the name being Hebrew. Why is that? Why is it a, a Hebrew name? Um, it's a Hebrew word. It can be found in the Bible. It's in Psalms. I don't know if you're familiar with the Bible. So um, it's it means to pause, rest, and reflect. And in, in the Bible, there's a chapter called Psalms. And it's um, they're basically songs that someone wrote. And in between them, they are these pauses where you get a chance to pause, rest, and reflect. So we are a faith-based organization. So our founders were Christian and that name really stood out to them in the Bible. Well, that's, that's absolutely amazing. So is Selah in, 
in New York? We are based in Sarasota, Florida, and we help um, Sarasota and Manatee County. And, um, but th since there is such that shortage of beds, a lot of the organizations throughout the country are reaching out to each other. Do you have any space? Do you, do you have room? And this is, I manage our info at, we have people asking if there is a bed availability daily, daily. We are putting up a page on our website with all the organizations that we, we have interviewed. I think just like education, awareness is, is the way to clean out things. And, you know, someone in my neighborhood could just want help, but doesn't know how to get it. So if he or she can stumble upon my website and find that information, I think that would be really helpful. So yeah, please tell me a little bit more about Sailor Freedom. How can anyone get in touch with them? Since we are based in Sarasota, Florida, unless there's anybody on here who's local, uh, you could volunteer. We always need people to help, you know, whether that's um, volunteering in our safe houses and just pouring in love and support into the survivors as they go through the program or helping us continue to spread awareness. So some other ways you could help is monetary donations. We are a nonprofit organization, so we rely heavily on donations to continue to go out and um, spread awareness going into the schools. Uh, our film is going to be out in March, and whatever I can do to help, I'll be more than happy to do it. As a survivor, I, I thank you for you're bringing more awareness and, and wanting to really make a difference because without people like you, I would probably still be stuck and trapped in, a, in this lifestyle. You know who is the hero in all of this? Is that gentleman who came to your hospital, was it, or, or the jail, the jail? Yeah, the, the man who shared Jesus with me and I had my spiritual awakening. And I, I just want, you know, for whoever is listening to this interview, I just want you guys to know that words mean so much and words can change people's lives. So choose your words carefully and, mm -hmm. and let it always try to help people. Let the words try to help people. Because if not for that person, Gabrielle, you wouldn't be here. He was the first person who came and was like, I care about you. I care about who you are and let me help you. And I accepted that with open arms instantly. Gabrielle, I really appreciate your time. I appreciate you sharing your life with us. Such a private thing. I am so proud and so happy that you have reached where you have reached. And, you know, hats off to you. Such a strong human, such a beautiful person. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate you coming up. Why don't you tell our audience how to get in touch with Sela so you can tell me your website and so on and so forth. You can go on to selafreedom.com. Sela is spelled S E L A H and then freedom.com. That's our website and there you'll see how you can volunteer or even donating and just learn more about us. We have some great testimonials on there as well that you can watch or you can um, email me at info at salafreedom.com. I appreciate your time and energy, Gabriel, and keep up the good work. You are absolutely amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me on here. I'm grateful.